One, two, three. Ready? Here we go. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Chalkboard History. We, wait a second. Wait a second. It was the professor's birthday yesterday. It was. How old are you, professor? I'm 28. Almost 30. The millennial slash Gen Zer is almost to the big three zero. Baby's on the way. Life's about to change. Dirty diapers. Ready for screaming. Yeah, yeah ready sort for of like that, after yes. Franklin. A mess. I was gonna say the life dirty changing. Diapers, maybe not, but anything else. <laughs> well, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. All right. So we're talking this morning. Other than what do you do for your birthday? Um, Let's talk about this for a minute. Well, I watched Kelly's Heroes, as is tradition. Oh, my God. Are you sure you're not 70? Don't hit me with those negative waves this early in the morning. <sighs> okay, we did that. And then I went to uh, Target and I bought a t-shirt. I got some pants. Yep, you're new 70. Slacks. Yep. New slacks. New Good slacks. Stuff. New slacks. How about then, a new sweater? Um... No, I like the black one. I no. did get a brand new green cardigan, though, last week. Oh, for the love of God. And then of last it. night we went out and we had some Chinese food. It was good. It's good stuff. I see you have your Longstreet book. I do. It was very good. Actually, just Oh, that's it. the new Longstreet book. Yeah. <gasps> the same person who wrote uh, Armies of Deliverance. Mm-hmm. Oh, my goodness. It's really Speaking good. of the lost cause, she will not probably be uh, welcomed at uh, Confederama uh, Maybe not. Avenue and... Fourth Street. So we're going to talk Probably about not. John Bell Hood and James Longstreet and the Lost Cause. So yeah. that's the reason I brought the book. To be completely fair. All right. Who? We'll see if how oh, you actually knew the who. Wow. All right. Hood, Longstreet, and the Lost Cause. You know they have one of the best Super Bowl halftime shows. Is the Who? Come on. The fact that you watched the Super Bowl halftime show. I only watched it for the who. Uh Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Yep. All right. So, James Longstreet. I thought we could kick off. How old was he? Was he 28 during the war? No, he was not 28. How old was he? I'm not sure. He was like 40, right? He's in, yeah. yeah. He fought in the Mexican War, so that puts him in the same age range as, like, the grants of the world. Now I have to look this up. Now you have to kind of look it up. But I wanted to to talk a little bit about, about Hood and about Longstreet because... For our discussions that we have... 1821. 1821. So then you do the Matthews 40, 40 when the war breaks out. Right? That is good math. Good math. History. Louisiana math. <laughs> that private education. That private Catholic school education came through for me. Um, well, let's talk about who they were. Well, I think certainly, yeah. But Hood and Longstreet both, for what we talk about, they are kind of the pantheon of Confederate generals, Right. Uh, you've got you know the Robert E. Lees, Stonewall Jacksons, and then kind of that that next tier is James Longstreet and John Bell Hood. Um, at least I would rank it that way. But they're at the top of their game throughout much of 1863, working alongside Lee and Jackson, and then of course Jackson's killed in May, and Longstreet becomes the kind of the right hand man, uh, the war horse uh, for for Lee, and then of course Hood's at the, his kind of. Uh, maximum of his career in 63 as a division commander under Lee and he's under Longstreet. The two of them are that kind of one-two punch of the Army in Northern Virginia. Uh, and then, of course, Hood comes out west. Longstreet even comes out west at 63, out to over Knoxville and fights at Chattanooga with Bragg and then heads out that way. And then they finish out the war, Hood here in Tennessee and Longstreet back right alongside Lee right up to April of 65 and not even really wanting to give up on April the 8th and 9th of 65. But by the time the war is over, I think we've talked about this before, certainly John Bell Hood seems kind of not comfortable, but accepted to the fact that that the war was over and that he had lost. And he goes home, and then Longstreet does very much the same thing. So how did these two, who were, as you said, uh, some of the best officers in the upper command of the Army of Northern Virginia. How did these two end up being so reviled by, not not necessarily by their contemporaries, although there was some of that, because Hood dies much earlier. Hood dies in 1879. Longstreet lived until, what, 1902, 1903, something like that. So actually, Longstreet is much more reviled because he, he lived longer. But how did these two 
Here's here's something to think about. No statues. Well, other than the horrible Lee, oh. hor- the Long Street statue at Gettysburg, where it looks like he's yeah. riding a pony, but there are no statues. Yeah. You know, so so Lee is Lee. Jackson is you know, Jackson is the mm-hmm. you know Christian warrior, and then Forrest is the bad boy rebel. How did the Longstreet, bad the rebel. bad boy rebel, he's like James Dean in a Confederate uniform <sighs> with a good hat. So how he's, did is Long he a rebel with a lost cause? Well, they did lose. So, so how did Longstreet and Hood, who were also both, by the way, badly wounded during the war. So I just looked it up. He died in 1904. 1904. So he was there for the big 1903. So what caused there. these two especially as we get into the 20th century, mm-hmm. to be hated by generations of people from, well, really from the, the you know, early 20th century all the way through the centennial to today. Because what do people complain about? Hood was an idiot and shouldn't have attacked at Franklin. Longstreet's mm-hmm. an idiot because he didn't do what Lee told him at Gettysburg. Mm-hmm. That's it. That's the end of the story. Yeah. How is that? How is that the end of the story? Well, I think... Certainly a big piece of it is the fact that both of them, after the war, tend to favor Reconstruction. Hood a little bit less publicly. Uh uh, Well, Uh save for the one speech in, what, 75 down in South Carolina. But Longstreet, after the war, seems to be very uh, kind of committed to getting things back to a sense of normal, certainly for he and his family. Um, and then also kind of getting into the business side of things. And, and there is a little bit of self-servingness to it as well. Uh, he's very willing to sign and pledge amnesty. He's very willing to take the, the loyalty oath. And he's also trying to get a business started back in New Orleans without any repercussions of, of being, you know, having his business shut down or, or targeted in any way. But I think both of them become critical of some of their maybe, uh, contemporaries at the time who hadn't quite given up the fight, the Jubal Airways of the world. Okay, but how many people in the 21st century even know that James Longstreet had anything to do with New Orleans? And most people don't even know that John Bell Hood lived there. You do because you're from there and you're also a student of the war. Mm -hmm. How is it that these two are so despised? What is it about them that is the lost cause envelopes both Mm -hmm. of them? Why is there this this? tacit disgust with both of these men. Well, for, for Longstreet, it's he criticized the Marble Man. Right? Mm, there we he, go. In the, his memoir, Manassas to Appomattox, he, he kind of, he's critical, less so than, you know, a lot of people portray. He just, you know, kind of agrees that maybe staying on the third day wasn't the greatest of options and that there were other alternatives. But you can't criticize Lee in the school of the lost cause. So you criticize Lee, you're out. So he did that. And then there's Hood, who, I mean, you, you said that it's because he just decides to attack at Franklin, but, you know, if you, you get on the old social media anytime right around November, uh, towards the end of November, you'll start to see Hood destroyed the army of Tennessee, Hood lost the war. And so he becomes this kind of scapegoat for defeat in the West, never mind the fact that Confederacy in the Western theater had always kind of fought on the back foot anyways. But Hood becomes the scapegoat for defeat in the West, and Longstreet becomes the scapegoat for defeat in the East, because he's critical of Lee. And it had Hood, had Longstreet done what Lee had asked him on the second day when he got the Dawn orders, there were no Dawn orders. That never happened. Okay, so ding, ding, ding. Sam Hood said to me years ago that had John Bell Hood died at Chickamauga, He'd have been he would like a be Jackson or a, 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 a Johnston. Had he died at Chickamauga, mm-hmm. he would be a hero to this day, yeah. and people would be saying, well, you know, if only Hood had been in command, yeah. Atlanta would have fallen. Is it possible that these two are uh, treated the way that they are? And I think they're getting better treatment today. I mean, mm-hmm. the fact that Elizabeth Verone writes a book about Longstreet mm-hmm. shows the evolution, because I think the last real substantive book on Longstreet was written by Jeffrey Wirt, yep. correct? Which yep. was 25 years ago. Whereabouts, yeah. Um, and it's a good book, but it's certainly not the same approach. That, well, Corey that she Farr takes. wrote that book in, about Longstreet at Gettysburg, but outside of that, right? He so Longstreet hasn't, he hasn't gotten a full. Right. So he wrote a Gettysburg book, right? About <laughs> right. Longstreet. About Longstreet, right? This is an actual biography. Mm-hmm. But is it possible that these two are suffering at the altar of Robert E. Lee? I mean, mm-hmm. it's Robert E. Lee, as yeah. Thomas Connolly said. Next to Jesus Christ, there was no one more popular than mm-hmm. Lee. 
And so Stonewall Jackson is like one of the disciples. Yeah. And then there's the bad boy Forrest. So these three fit the bill. They're mm-hmm. like the holy trinity well, of the should, Confederacy. You should add a fourth into there too, because it's the thing that we'll who? see out here. Claiborne. Pat Claiborne, because Hood becomes the man who had him no, killed. No, I don't think so. He has his own fan club. I, I Claiborne is his Claiborne is his own thing, but that's way later. Hood's mm-hmm. already in the doghouse long before Claiborne is cool. Mm-hmm. Hood's in the doghouse and Longstreet's in the doghouse, in my opinion, Mm -hmm. because they're not Lee, they're not Jackson, and they're not Forrest. Mm -hmm. Jackson's dead. Yep. Lee dies early. Right. Forrest is the symbol of resistance through the Ku Klux Klan. Yep. Whether people want to admit it or not, he was in the Klan, and why wouldn't he have been? Mm -hmm. These two take a totally different approach. Yeah. A totally different approach. And I think part of their problem is a hundred year problem. It's a multi-generational issue Mm -hmm. is they were despised by just enough of their contemporaries at the time to be recorded in the histories then and then picked up by the children and the grandchildren. Right. What? Because the United Daughters of the Confederacy, I'll go back to what I said earlier. They immortalized like Roman and Greek gods, human beings. Mm Mm-hmm. And they specifically omitted James Longstreet and John Bill Hood, among others. You won't find, frankly, Joseph Johnson or Braxton Bragg in a long list of others. That was done with intent Mm -hmm. because they were traitors to the Southern cause. Mm -hmm. Longstreet became a Republican, for God's sake. He stood up for black people in New Orleans. John Bill Hood doesn't live and and of course as you pointed out longstreet criticized lee at gettysburg Mm -hmm. when longstreet according to jubal early was the only person deserving of the criticism and hood like longstreet seems quite like a like a Mm grown-up willing to accept the result of the war Mm -hmm. which means they lost and we're able to move on to the point Mm -hmm. where when when sam hood found the the you know hood's papers years ago the fact that John Bell Hood and William T. Sherman are having Christmas together mm-hmm. still cracks me up. It's the most awkward Christmas ever. But I bet it wasn't awkward. Mm-hmm. I bet it... I. Why would why would it be awkward? Maybe he brings up the uh, the letter exchange outside of Atlanta or maybe the entire they, family. Or maybe they didn't. Yeah. They could have just moved on. Well... Why would why else would they have gotten together other mm-hmm. than they were old warriors? Mm-hmm. They had fought it out on the field of battle, and that was that. Yeah. I mm-hmm. don't Hood has never struck me as a sort of crybaby like that. Yeah. Why? Same thing with Longstreet. Yeah. Well, Longstreet goes to work for Grant as, during right. his presidency, and he's a, a constant kind of supporter of Reconstruction throughout the entire period. And they saw that the United States had been preserved, and they were mm-hmm. going to do their part to help rebuild it. In fact, Hood's um, request for amnesty is something that, you know, the, as, as I say from time to time, the Confederados, they should plaster this all over their Facebook pages. When when Hood said that he would, that he swore allegiance to the United States and he would, he would work with the same fervor to restore it mm-hmm. with the same energy that he, that he had utilized to tear it apart, he could actually do both things. Mm-hmm. He could say, yes, I did this, But that's in the past, and Mm -hmm. I will now work toward a brighter future. And you know what? I think that's where Lee was headed. Mm -hmm. But the problem is he died, Mm -hmm. and Jackson was already dead. And Forrest doesn't follow them far later. You know, all three of them are dead by the time Hood is. Mm -hmm. And the Southern... Dun-dun-dun-dun! They're everywhere. The early versions of the Bible, right here, because this is where it starts. And what Mm -hmm. does this morph into? Ultimately... Confederate veteran. Confederate veteran. And then it is the lost cause in full froth for the next generation. And by the time you get to the centennial, well, you know, it's old Woodenhead. Mm -hmm. And Longstreet's dragging his feet all the way on. Sulking. Sulking. It's one of my favorite descriptions. Tom Berenger's horrible beard. This is how badly James Longstreet is treated. His beard in Gettysburg mm-hmm. is like glued to Beringer's face. It's just terrible. At least the one kind of credit you can give that movie is it tried to be a little sympathetic towards Longstreet. That's it. 
True, and Behringer, yeah. I think, does a, a pretty good job, although I, I do get a little ill when I watch the dialogue between him and Colonel Fremantle. Uh, I don't know. The dialogue between him and Lee's pretty bad, too. Uh, but the best dialogue is uh, 105-year-old John Bell Hood saying, we <laughs> yeah. should have gone around to the right, you know, which is... He's already dead in that scene. You just don't know. <laughs> right, which is still that line alone we've joked about. Mm-hmm is the lost cause mm -hmm. that had only Lee listened mm -hmm. to what James Longstreet was saying, or in reverse, depending mm -hmm. on which way you want to argue this, the whole battle would have turned out differently. Even today, not, not another one, I, I've got to throw this in. What about Richard Ewell? You know, he, mm -hmm. gets, he gets lumped in with these guys. He's like a villain, mm -hmm. especially with Gettysburg, because he should have taken, you know, Culp's Hill, Hill should have yeah. taken the heights. So what, what does it mean? What, what is their legacy long term? Because Hood, just last week, I had someone fussing about Hood, and then the topic of Fort Hood's name being changed came up, and he was very upset about that. And I said, well, so which is it? Hood's an idiot? And should never have been in command, mm -hmm. or that he had a fort name for him and the name got changed. Which is more upsetting? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't at least be consistent. Pick one. Yeah. Pick one. Yeah. You know, if he's such a fool, then maybe he never should have had a fort named for him. But, you know, that's now, so it's now Fort Cavazza. So, mm -hmm. what's Hood and Longstreet's legacy in the war long term? Or, uh, here's a really dangerous question Do they really matter? Mm. You know, do do John does John Bell Hood and does James Longstreet really matter, or were they were they materials to be used to build the lost cause atop? Mm. Were they themselves collateral damage? So I finished this last night, and it's the whole reason that we kind of decided to go with this topic. I just wanted to show you, maybe read out for our listeners this last little bit here. Is this like an epilogue or is this in a chapter? This is, this is her conclusion about Longstreet. Get it where I can actually see it and talk into the microphone. That's age time. if you can't see it. You see what I deal with all the time? He walked in. My good morning was you're almost 30. So. That's what your dad did. I'm just following in his footsteps. Yeah, that's fair. Longstreet never fit the pro profile of a marble man whose story could be set in stone. His political evolution and public image were too complex and, contra and contradictory for that. Longstreet fought the Civil War to win it. If he had succeeded, slavery would have persisted in his own remarkable reinvention, and the reforms he promoted after Appomattox would have never come to pass. To me, surrender of my sword was my reconstruction. I looked upon the lost cause as totally, irrevocably lost, so Longstreet mused in 1880, capturing why he has been the most embattled military figure in America's Civil War. We like to bestow praise on historical figures who had the courage of their convictions. Longstreet's story is a reminder that the arc of history is sometimes bent by those who had the courage to change their convictions. He accepted defeat with a measure of grace and tried to learn and then to teach the past lessons. And for that, he commands our attention as one of the most enduringly relevant voices in American history. I can't argue with that. Yeah. And I think the same could be said for, for Hood in a sense, but he never gets the chance really to to be on the, the kind of back end. He dies so early after the war, 79. He doesn't get the opportunity to tell his side of the story and then certainly to show, as Longstreet got a chance to do, show what those changes should look like. I once believed that had men like Pat Claiborne lived had survived the war mm -hmm. and had lived for 20 or 30 years that the path forward would have been different. The resistance in the, in the old South would have been less and you know, mm -hmm. that things would have turned out better, quite mm -hmm. frankly, for the country as a whole. I was wrong. I think that Claiborne's death was just that. And that had he survived and taken a course somewhat similar to Longstreet, or Hood, and, and none of us know what Claiborne really would have done. Right. But I only mention this because we know what Hood and Longstreet did, and look how they were treated. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were thrown on t into the dustbin of history yep. because they didn't fit the mm -hmm. marble man role. And, and who could be Lee? Right. But the way that 
um, Jefferson Davis, we haven't talked about him, and the way, the adulation and and how dare you criticize any of the aforementioned Forrest, mm-hmm. Jackson, etc. Yeah. But Hood and Longstreet beat them up, knock them around, call them names. Yeah. It is, which is always so interesting when I consider how, quite frankly, the sons of Confederate veterans and the United Daughters of the Confederacy treat their Southern heroes. Mm-hmm. They they specifically picked and chose their Southern heroes. And then they bag on the rest of them. And bag on the rest of them. Yep. And and the Southern hero list, other than you know Johnny Reb, Sam Watkins, mm-hmm. the, the the leadership, Pretty Lee, narrow. yeah, Jackson, Davis, Forrest, Stewart. You know it it's it's a mm-hmm. those are the big guys. But Hood and Longstreet brag. Yeah. Among others, yeah. just re- T. Beauregard <clears throat> gets bagged too. Just relentlessly beat up. And I mm-hmm. think that it is wonderful to see books like that. And and I, I'll share one last thing. Sam Hood, who I've now referenced several times since Sam and I have known each other now almost <clears throat> twenty five years. Wow. I've we, known him for about twenty yeah, years. So. Wow. <laughs> we, we knew you since you were a little professor. We knew each other since you were a little professor. Um he texted me. Today's, what is today? The fifth? Fourth? Fifth? Today's the fifth. Today's the fifth. He texted me on the second or the third and said it was the first anniversary of the Battle of Franklin since he's been on the internet that there wasn't somebody dogging Hood. Yeah. You know, and, and calling him names and attacking him. And he said, thanks for the work that you guys do every day to just try and give Hood some balance. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, put him in in a more appropriate place. So I think that's that was that was nice to hear. And that's nice to hear that out there um, there is less of that kind of silly criticism. Mm-hmm. Good revision. They fought for what they believed in. They lost and then they tried to rebuild their own lives. Mm-hmm. I think that's that's worthy of some appropriate Scholarly work and, and recognition. And to tried, tried to help rebuild the nation, too. Right. In their own way. Yeah. That's right. All right. That's it? Are That's we done? Good long street, long That's cause, lost cause, long cause, long, long gone, street cause. Long, yes. cause, long street. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.